cardiologist had just either ballooned or stented the right coronary artery, and he, he says to this uh, gentleman, uh, I got uh, good news for you. The only blockage in your coronary was in the right coronary, and I fixed it. You're fine. You know, go home and celebrate. Well, this patient was enrolled in a clinical trial that required us to do an intravascular ultrasound, not of the stented vessel, but of the angiographically normal contralateral vessel, the LAD. And you don't see any narrowing in that vessel. What I want to do now is take you to the cath lab and show you the angiogram and then show you the IVUS so that you can understand how remodeling confounds the diagnosis of coronary disease. So here's the angiogram, and I'll play it on the monitor for you. This is my Steven Spielberg moment. I like making these videos. That's the vessel of interest. Looks normal angiographically. Let's look at the intravascular ultrasound, full motion. And I'll show you where we are. And you see that plaque right there? Whoa, there's nothing there on the angiogram. Another big plaque over here, huge plaque. And you soon realize that every millimeter of this LAD has plaque. It's diffusely diseased. Well, why don't we see it on the angiogram? Let me show you four slices. Slice number one, close to normal. Slice number two, a large crescent-shaped plaque. Slice number three, a huge plaque. And slice number four, another huge plaque. Why is the angiogram normal? It's normal because the lumen size here and here and here and here is exactly the same. Coronary disease is not by and large an intraluminal disease, it's an extraluminal disease. And the reason this is so important, you could put this patient on a treadmill, you're going to see nothing. You could do a nuclear perfusion study. You're going to see no abnormality. And yet this guy is a walking time bomb because if one of those plaques ruptures, there's going to be hell to pay. And we realized that about 1990, 91, 92, as we began to do these IVUS studies. And that was what stimulated you know, my interest and many others in trying to find ways to treat not the stenosis, which is what intervention treats, but atheromatosis, the atherosclerotic disease, that is what kills patients. So about the time we were doing this work, a whole a group of independent investigators published a series of studies that made this all make sense. They took patients that had had an MI, that had had an angiogram within the previous six weeks or so, and they went back and looked at the angiogram, and they then looked at the site where the coronary occluded. And they published studies that showed that the vast majority of sites that subsequently occluded, causing a heart attack, had little or no stenosis six weeks earlier. And so it was a perfectly logical, it now became, made a lot of sense to us for the first time that it wasn't the narrowings. Now, why is this so profound? Because two million times in America, patients are laid on a cath lab table and somebody squirts their coronaries and tells them whether they have one, two, or three vessel coronary disease. But we're missing the big picture. The big picture is not whether they have a narrowing or two, it's how much atherosclerosis do they have in their coronary bed, and how, many, how much atherosclerosis they have in their carotids, and in their, other, and in their renals, and everywhere else. These findings also explained a paradox. I never understood as a cardiology fellow that if coronary disease were a disease of gradual narrowing of the artery, then most patients would present with angina. But that's not how most patients present. In about two-thirds of men and half of women, the very first symptom of coronary disease is a heart attack or sudden death. So a minority of people present with angina. And the reason is they don't have a lot of stenosis, these people. They don't have, even have enough stenosis to have angina, but they have enough plaque to cause sudden death or a heart attack. If you want to make a case for prevention, there's no better case than this because there's no warning. 
You know, if you don't prevent this disease, the first time it crops up, the horse is out of the barn. And that's the case, the most important case for prevention. Now, I want to show you another example of remodeling, one that for us was very pivotal. This now, taking you forward chronologically, is now 1993. And my colleague, Dr. Murat Tushu, has joined us. And uh, uh, the importance of that to factor will, will be apparent in just a minute. Let me show you another example of coronary remodeling. Here's a, an artery, the circumflex, it turns out, that's normal. A few millimeters away, I'll show you another slice. Whoops, giant plaque. You don't see anything there on the angiogram despite a huge plaque. Why don't you see it on the angiogram? Well, same reason. The lumen size is exactly the same in the narrowed area, or in the, in the plaque-laden area and in the normal area. The outward remodeling of the adventitia has completely compensated for the presence of plaque. And so the plaque is invisible to the angiogram. Now, why was this one so profound? Well, this is one of the first cases we saw. This is a, the heart of a 32-year-old woman who's perfectly healthy, as far as we know, until she runs her car into a tree in Cincinnati, Ohio, and has a head injury. And she's eventually declared brain dead, and her family donates her heart for transplantation. Our surgeons harvest the heart and transplant into the body of a 25-year-old man with end-stage cardiomyopathy, successfully transplanted. And a few days later, my colleague, Mirat Tushu, who had a protocol to do this, does intravascular ultrasound of the donor heart in the new recipient. And this young woman at age 32, perfectly healthy, had no less than a dozen large atherosclerotic lesions in her coronaries not a single one of which could be seen on the angiogram. At age 32, 100% of her disease was extraluminal. There is no test on this planet, even today, that could tell you that she had plaque in her coronaries, but she did. And she had it at a pretty young age. Well, Dr. Tushu went on and studied a whole series of patients that were heart transplant donors. So you're looking at the hearts of Americans who died in motor vehicle accidents primarily, although some from other causes, was almost always trauma. You're looking at a snapshot of what the hearts of young people in America look like. And it's a wake up call. This is a 33 year old man. This is his LAD very large atherosclerotic plaque in his LAD. And look at that uh, in his circumflex. And the words of uh, one of our more articulate technicians in the IVUS lab, that's a large goober in the coronaries. And uh, you don't want that at age 33 in your coronary. And yet that's exactly what this young man had at the time of his death. Here's another 32-year-old woman. And this a uh, woman has this disease in her left circumflex and this giant plaque in the ramus branch of her left coronary artery. You know, young women think they're immune to coronary disease. Uh, it drives me crazy when, I, when, I, when I, uh, I drive by the John Hay High School around the corner here and I see the young women out in front of school smoking cigarettes. You know, it makes my hair stand on end, which is really hard for me. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, I know what I know what young women's hearts look like, and they are almost as bad as young men's hearts. They're a little better, but not a lot better. And if that isn't bad enough, this is a 17-year-old boy. Um, you know, I know this may surprise you, but uh, Cleveland is a violent town, and uh, this guy, young man, was in a drug deal, gone awry, got shot in the head, and had a le had a fatal head injury. Heart was donated. And at age 17, he had this plaque in his left anterior descending coronary artery. We don't know a lot about these young people, but we know something. Uh, his body mass index was between 32 and 33. So if you want to see this kid, I can show him to you. Just take a walk with me over to the McDonald's. And he's that young man standing in line ordering the supersized burger and fries. 
At age 17, he's already obese. Uh, he's already got plaque in his coronaries. You know, who knows when he'll have his first heart attack if he doesn't die, uh, as he did, you know, in, 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 in drug-related violence. But the reality is this is a very bad disease that people get at a very young age. Again, I'm making the case for what you do, which is all about prevention. Dr. Tushu went on and about a decade ago, about 10 years ago, he published our experience remarkably and never a, a feat never accomplished by anybody else and never will be. He actually took 262 consecutive heart transplant donors, young Americans who died of motor vehicle accidents, typically average age of about 30. And this is the incidence of having at least one big plaque in their coronaries. One in seven teenagers uh, had at least one big plaque in their coronaries. One third between the ages of 20 and 29 had a large plaque in their coronaries. What's the, what's the, why did you choose that threshold? It's actually four standard deviations beyond normal. I is, that, is that more likely to rupture? Is it less likely to no. rupture? It's it's just sa it it just says that, it, that it's a plaque. Um, it's not more likely to cause a fatal heart attack than a small one that ruptures. Right. What we, all it says is that there's disease there. And what we did was we established normals and then we, we decided to be very conservative. We required them to be four standard deviations above normal before we called it a plaque. Normal meaning a normal blood vessel. Normal blood vessel, yes. Not a normal person because all normals have this. Well, showing not all normal. Well, no. showing by age 50, all normals yeah. have Yeah, but if you study 18-year-olds, you know, most of them don't. And so, you know, again, this is real disease, no question about it in everybody's mind. And we also have necropsy data that help us with this as well. We know how thick your intima ought to be, and this is clearly disease. Now, um, uh, I'm in this category, uh, in the 30 to 39 category, so I have better than a 50-50 chance of having the, this disease. And if I live to be as old as Dr. Roizen, uh, I'll be right up here, and I'd sure like to see Mike Roizen's coronaries. You know you're cruel. I'd just love to know whether, whether his lifestyle, which is about as good as it can get, you know, wouldn't you like to know? Anyway, uh, if you, just come, come see me. All right. So bottom line. Well, there's uh, some risk to the IVUS, right? There's some risk, yeah. I'm, not, I'm just kidding you. No, no, but I mean, isn't that why you don't do it routinely? Absolutely. We do it not routinely at all. We do it for studies. You know, and some of the folks in C5 that help us do these studies are here. So... Uh, let me tell you how it is. You have this disease, and I have this disease, and if you look at the person sitting to the right of you, one of the two of you is going to die of this disease. Um, when a man or a woman comes in the coronary care unit with an MI at age 45, the disease did not start when they were 43. It started way back here. And our findings, by the way, are not entirely novel. Pathologists during the Korean and Vietnam Wars did autopsies on soldiers, and they claimed that they saw lots of plaques in the coronaries. Most people didn't believe them. They thought there was something about the stress of combat that was making it artifactual. It wasn't wrong. It's how it is that if you look at young people's coronaries in their 20s and 30s, they've already got plaques there. And it is something that we have to understand and deal with as a society if we're ever going to beat the disease.